Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Hank Cisco Show. Let's go. As Hank Cisco would say, don't touch that dial. This is the Hank Cisco Show, 31st year. And for all those people that have asked me about Hank, how he's doing, wishing him good will and prayers and, and best wishes, Hank's doing great. He is a, a born fighter, and he will never lose, as he says, a fight in the locker room. Uh, today I'm very excited because we have two very unique guests here. Both are immigrants to this country. Both come from an entirely different type of background than anything here in the United States. And uh, this, those of you that have been born here and everything else, I think it's important to hear their story and how they've handled the different, the move here, learning the language in one case, and understanding the people and how to deal with the uh, different adversities that come along. So we have Professor uh, Jason D. Hill. Uh, this is um, one of his books. He's a prolific writer, philosopher, uh, doctor of philosophy at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, and we have Malka Ripken Kanner, who is Ripken uh, Kanner, who is uh, active in her community and has a very successful businesswoman, uh, finance uh, uh, in, uh, investment finance company that she has had since 1982, 82, 83. She's extremely successful people, and they made it here in America, which is very unique. So I'm going to turn first to uh, Professor Hill. And, uh, Professor, you were from Jamaica. That's right. And tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in Jamaica, uh, where you were from. Well, I, I was raised in a middle-class family. Uh, I come from a long line of socialism. Can, can, can I ask you this? So when we talk about middle class, the vision of middle class here is probably, probably a little different than the vision of middle class in Jamaica. So maybe give us some reference point what that would be like if uh, you were... Uh, well, I went to an exclusive private school. Uh, from the age of three and a half. Um, I had a, a very good uh, private education, went to the best private school in the entire Caribbean, and uh, was reading from I was three years old. So um, I came from, a, my mother divorced my father when I was uh, seven, so she was a banker by profession, she was an accountant. We didn't have a lot of money, but we did have the best education possible. And I came to America when I was um, 20 years old because you were you were saying about your grandfather was a communist. He was a, he was a communist. He was he was put in a detention center by the British when uh, my father was uh, not yet born because he drove uh, the English out of uh, Jamaica. He was a pioneer in the independence movement. About what time in history was this? This was around 1939. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was slated to have become Jamaica's first prime minister, but he was an intellectual and wanted to continue his work as a pioneer in the independence movement and, and uh, continue being a, 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 a trade unionist, actually, and a journalist, and uh, turned that position down and went on to, to continue his work as a writer. And uh, I was never tempted by socialism or communism. I thought it was pure malarkey and political calumny. And uh, I think I was the only person in my family who, who, my grandmother was a socialist, his wife. So your grandfather was a communist, your father was a socialist, your grandmother was a socialist, and your mother was an accountant and banker. So that's a very interesting background. And, and you're a capitalist. So that's I'm, a, I'm a capitalist. <laughs> which is very interesting. I'm a bona fide capitalist. So now you're 20 years old and you're getting on that plane. What was your, before you got on the plane, before you decided to move to America, what was your vision of what America was? What did you expect out of America? Well, I had fallen in love with America from a very early age. I had read American history from, I was about um, 12, because we had been taught American history. And I thought, and I still think, that America is the greatest republic that has ever existed, and probably will ever exist on the face of the earth. That this was an exceptional country um, and that its people were the most exceptional people that had ever existed. It was an unprecedented phenomenon uh, for many, many reasons. It was not based on, citizenship was not based on lineage, on blood, on tribalism, on national origin or ethnic origin. 
but was theoretically and empirically open to all persons, that it was based on an aspirational longing that you could write the accidents of birth and become whatever it is that you wanted to become and start what I call metaphysically clean from scratch. So I had high hopes for America. I thought in America I could become what I aspired to become. I could, I could, I could write the script and more importantly, I could become part of the American landscape. So when I boarded that flight, I thought that this is the first day of my life because you don't choose to become, uh, you're handed a script at birth and you're handed a role identity throughout your life but the opportunity to become what you truly want to become is quite rare. And America granted me that opportunity. So now you're on the plane and you have this anticipation of landing in, uh, in the United States. And, and you landed in Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and, and this was what? 19, 1985. 1985. So you're landing, so you're, coming, you're flying over the, the land and, and how were you emotionally feeling before that, those wheels touched down? Quite emotional. I made a covenant with uh, America. I said that I promised my, my new country that I would um, cultivate the best within myself and I would conjoin the best within myself with the best of America and make a marriage between the two and that that marriage would, we would conspire and that that marriage would cultivate a moral ethos and a moral character within myself that would be supplanted onto the American landscape and that that would continue to uh, navigate a journey throughout America that would circumvent, transcend all disappointments that I would find. But it was a covenant that I made with America. It was very, very emotional. You know, it reminds me uh, uh, Jack Kennedy, who was a president in 1960, uh, I'm sure you, you're familiar with uh, him. In his inauguration speech, he talked about, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Clearly, your covenant blended that, the, that, that concept out there. And that, you're 1985, which you're you know, 25 years after Jack Kennedy made that speech. It would be really interesting to me if all Americans made that covenant at That's some right. point in their life. Right. I think what you see happening in our country today would be so different because it wouldn't be about them, it would be about this covenant to make this land much better. That's right. To make it better. It's taking the best within yourself and supplanting it onto the country and, con and, con and not, not competing necessarily with your compatriots but achieving in conjunction with your compatriots and finding the best within themselves and conjoining the best within yourself and the best within themselves and creating something quite beautiful, something quite magnificent. Very interesting. Yes, and I was going to get to you because you No, no, you're, but about what he's saying. Well, let me, okay. let me do this. Let me ask you, Malka. Uh, now, you came from a little we, different background, but go ahead, why don't you? I just want to comment on that. I think this is what attracted everybody to this country because the United States, the founding fathers, created this space for people like you to come here and want to be what they want to be. And this is how this country was built by what Kennedy say, ask what you can do for your country. And that's how this country was founded and was built on, at least for the first couple hundred years or maybe. <laughs> right now we don't know about that. Yeah. But your story's a little different uh, because you actually are a Palestinian because you were born before Israel became Israel. Right. So you were Palestinian because you're... Second generation Second generation. So you had your grandfather came to Palestine in the early 1900s and your father and everything else and they were very much involved in, in the development of the, the state of Israel. But when you grew up, you grew up, you were born in 47, I believe. 46. 46. End of 46. End of 46. And so now though the, the, war for, the war that was started in 48, which established, of course, the UN started the, the nation, you've pretty much, during your young I, time, you lived under th threats all the time, You're running to bomb shelters and everything else like that. Right. I don't know, and we have a lot of young people uh, in the audience here that uh, some are filming this, but uh, they are listening here, but could you imagine if you lived under that type of scenario 
where every day, if you heard uh, the alarm go off, what it was like to do that. So I want to make, uh, I'm going to say something that I just heard from somebody this week. It says, a fish doesn't know that he is wet. So growing up in Israel, though I grew up in a well-to-do home, in a capitalistic, philanthropic family, uh, the bombs and the shelters and the terrorism, all those things were part of like you're in the water. You don't think about life being other than that. And uh, I understand what you're saying, yes. But for people seeing this show, I asked them to put themselves in that position, what it would be like to grow up under the, that, and how and that, can fo that can actually mold who you are to a degree well, today, an appreciation of what is here. So, what, so coming here in 1964, which is 55 years ago, um, there was a sense of security in the streets. Wherever you go, it's comfortable. You're not worried about anybody attacking you. Uh, it was years before we had any suicide bombers and all these things that were happening here. And uh, uh, again, going back to Israel, it is very unclear to people what it's like to live under this stress that today we have a young generation that in the last 20 years are exposed to it. They live a few kilometers, a few miles from the border and they are, that's the condition they are living under. And I remember coming into this country, it's like you don't know people, you see the sh shades of color. Everybody. Everybody is free, everybody is open. And uh, I, I have to bring anti Semitism here because growing up in Israel, I grew up in a community, I did not feel anti Semitism. I knew the Jewish people who were arriving from Europe. My next, uh, we had few neighbors in the building that had uh, the numbers. Had the numbers from the. Uh, and I remember my par my mom especially. Whenever we asked the question, they would say, nobody spoke about the Holocaust. They were embarrassed to come out of the Holocaust instead of understanding how lucky they were. So uh, again, um, it's like I said, you don't know you're wet. You are used to this uh, condition until you get out of it and you can look back at how you were raised and coming to this country and hearing the expression that uh, were the Jewish people were called. I remember going uh, uh, to a place where they used the arms when I said I came from Israel and the person dis didn't understand, so somebody pointed arms about, and this so, was... So that was kind of a, a, a an eye-opener to you. I know that all, all the most immigrants that came here, I mean, I remember my father showing me an ad from the 1920s because he came over when he, uh, he was for, he was uh, born in Italy and came here, so I'm first generation. But I remember showing him, me an ad, you know, that talked about you know Jews, Polish, uh, Negroes, and Italians need not apply. So there was a lot of ethnic, and in the Irish faced this in the 1800s. So we all we have all faced hardship. It's how we handle that. That's it, people. people. We that's, still that's, talk to them. They were our neighbors. Yeah, that's, that's how we handle it. Professor, you, in your book, you talk about this. And why don't you explain how you dealt with it? Because I know you landed in Atlanta, and you went to this town called Stone, what was it, Stone mm, Mountain? Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain, which was kind of like almost the headquarters of the KKK. That's right. <laughs> to a degree. Yes. So here you are, a Jamaican <laughs> coming into Atlanta, going to Stone Mountain, which is uh, with the KKK. How did you handle that? Well, first of all, I came uh, culturally with, uh, with a certain kind of psychological apparatus. I came here with absolutely no fear of white people. I came here as a person thinking that I had no less of a humanity than white people. So I came here psychologically quite arrogant, thinking that no person has a coercive monopoly on the American opportunity. So I simply adduced myself as evidence of the stupidity of racism. Mm -hmm. And I, when I encountered any kind of racism, I simply addressed it head on. Uh, I did not attempt to change anybody's way of life. I simply communicated that I'm here to slice, to, to slice out a piece of the American dream 
for myself. I have never met anyone in my life who has ever been able to intimidate me. The only person who intimidated me was my mother. And that ended <laughs> yeah, at, I, some, I, at some <laughs> point in my 20s, that ended. So I've never met anyone who was ever able to intimidate me. And growing up in Jamaica, which was one of the most violent countries in the world. That's right. Yeah, right? That's, yeah. And when, 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 you, when you face that level of crime, when you know people who've been raped, um, Ku Klux Klan members are just an iteration of that. So most of them treated us and treated me with respect. I don't know what they thought of me privately, but I think people are like sharks smelling blood in the water. When they smell fear, they're predators. And when they smell confidence and they smell, sense no fear, they don't really mess with you. Mm -hmm. So I, con I conveyed a sense of unbridled confidence, individualism, and that I would truck no nonsense from anyone and got along quite nice with them, nice with them. My grandmother became the most favored parishioner in their church, in the church, in the, in the, in the, church, in the neighborhood. Uh, by the end of the year, she was the most favored parishioner. And they wanted to know, you know, some of them wanted to know with their Confederate flag, they would say, you know, <laughs> ball, what you're going to do with your laugh? And, uh, and I, you know, I was 20 years old. I looked like 15 at the time. And I didn't like being called boys. I said, I politely said, I'm 20 years old and my name is Jason and you can call me Jason. And I said, I, I was going to be a philosopher and a writer. And I said, that's interesting. So you want me a psychologist? I said, no, a philosopher. And I told them what a philosopher did. And, uh, and, and treated them with respect. And, and in time, you know, we developed a, 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 a code of civility mm -hmm. among us. Right. But I think this is the thing with, with Americans uh, of, of any shade, that you have to sort of uh, treat, teach people how to treat you. And you have to uh, in communicate that you are possessed of an inviolable dignity and intrinsic moral worth. And that is not up for negotiation that across my forehead is not written uh, doormat. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's how I dealt with it. And I still, to this day, I still will not tolerate any kind of uh, um, uh, racism or injustice or, or um, transgressions against me. Now, now I, and I do this without claiming victimization. I'm not a victim. Th that was another thing. In your book, I, you know, if, if I could sum it up, you know, to me it was, you're only a victim if you let yourself be a victim, yeah. basically. And, 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 that, and, and you talk about some of these people who write about that they're victim by this, they blame everybody, this part, this, that person. And, and, and it clearly, you challenge that at every level. That's right. And, and you prove it through, uh, through reasoned uh, discussion in your book how that's not true. Right. Because there's, been, there's enough indication out there of people who've made it uh, and have attained something uh, of themselves. So it really, uh, to the young people here, you know, it's all about what you make of yourself, what you, you do with yourself, what your education level is and everything else, and what you're willing to say. You don't have to be the brightest person in the world. Just be true to yourself uh, and be, have integrity, and, and you will go far, yeah. no matter what. The victimism comes from having no plans. You came here very specifically. You had a vision, what you want to create for yourself, and you kind of had a tunnel vision that kept you and the victims, if we hear today or in the past, are those that really don't have a, a plan or don't have anything else, so they blame others for what's going on with them rather than creating something that, for that, that's a, Malcolm, that's a very interesting statement you made, that, that people, if you have a plan, you just th then, keep on going. then that's going to be your plan. If you don't have anything and you're just scattershot all over the place, the if you don't make it, yeah. oh, I had bad luck, oh, that person prevented me from doing you something. You look to blame somebody else. Right, right. You know, it's a white man's world or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, so these are the things that, uh, that we have to get, get away from. You know, from a f philosophical point of view, you know, we know in the past there have been horrendous mm -hmm. mistakes. And I believe humanity stands today on the shoulders of all those mistakes that hopefully we got better and that we don't fall into those same traps that happened in history. I don't know about you, but I kind of see that happening today that we're, we're forgetting about history. Our Americans' attention spans about like two seconds mm -hmm. and they forget all this stuff that I we're in the past. I don't know that we don't that we necessarily forget. We are not teaching, we are getting older and they're not teaching the younger ones the history 
and are creating a different vision for them, which is pulling them away. And uh, if they went back to civics and back to basics and bring the history to the present, because whether it's the Bible or European history or world history, there is a lot of lessons to be learned from there. You know, one Not of the to repeat them. One of the things, you know, being a professor in, in, col in a college, and DePaul I wouldn't call by any stretch of the imagination a conservative college at all, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure you, you know. To say uh, the least. To say the least. So I'm sure you're kind of the odd man out, so to speak, uh, you know, in many levels there. But I know you have tenure, so that it's difficult for them to, you know, to, uh, to kick you out. But what are some of the conflicts you face as a professor today on campus in which this very liberal, progressive uh, uh, victimization type of education is being taught? What, what's your feeling about well, what you face? Well, the main problem is really coming from the far left, who have told, who has told uh, ethnic minorities and women, blacks, African Americans, uh, Native Americans, Hispanics, that you have no creative agency. They have completely expropriated the agency of, 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 of minorities and told them that you have no initiative. You cannot apply your creative agency to solve problems in your lives the way that I certainly did. And that there is a managerial class that will take care of all your problems for you. There's a grievance committee around every single corner to whom you can lodge your complaints. That if you dare, how dare you tell any minority that his or her fate lies in his hands, that the state is not responsible ultimately to solve your problem, that white people are not coming to save you, that it is not ultimately the responsibility of white people to save you. Your communities and you are primarily the soul, you primarily primarily are the sole source of your responsibility. And I want to say one more thing. When I say this on campus, that the procreative choices that people make in their lives are their responsibility. When you make a procreative choice, a reproductive choice to have a child, and you pass that on to society, that is an egregious moral failure on the part of the individual. That society is not responsible for the procreative choices that other people have made. And the responsibility lies not with society, it lies with your parents. And when you are an adult, when you turn 21, that responsibility lies with you. I had to work up to four jobs, 45 hours a week, to put myself through school. And I graduated magna cum laude, at the top of my class before I won a scholarship to pursue my PhD. Not once did I think it was the state's or anyone's business to, put, to help me. I never qualified for student loans. I never qualified for government aid. I worked four jobs. I went to school full time. I worked four to five hours. I never complained. I never said I never had a sense of entitlement. I thought my responsibility, this is my sacred life. This is, I'm a grown man. I started college at 22 years old because I couldn't afford to start college earlier because I had to work. And I get into a lot of trouble when I say things on campus like, you're not a victim because your responsibility is, your, is yours. You're not a victim because someone has said something racist towards you. If someone says something racist towards you, hold them by the collar, you're a grown person with bulging muscles. I've got, I used to have spaghetti arms. Hold them by the collar and dress them down and put them in their place. Don't go run into some grievance committee. I'm not saying violate their bodily integrity and, and punch them because you're gonna end up in jail. But you take that person and you put them in the corner and you dress them down and you t tell them about their mother, insult them. You know, you, you take your life into your hands and take responsibility for what has been done to you. Now, there is something called institutional racism that we have to grapple with, right? And that, is, that has been a serious problem that uh, I think the 1964 Civil Rights Act took care of that problem, but it, there are still residual effects of that that lingers. 
However, I think that society has progressed. I work, I've been a professor for 23 years. I think that it has gone way beyond the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean that if you're a black male, if you're a transgendered lesbian, or a trans person today, if you're a black man with a C average, there is no college in America that will not send a jet plane to get you in there with a C average. I know this because I sit on these admissions committee, right? So we, are, we have gone to such a progressive length to pursue minorities. minorities. Black men are sought after in colleges. Uh, transgendered people, they're the hottest commodity on, 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 on campuses today. Campuses are so progressive. The attrition rate among Latino, mostly men, is so high that colleges will do anything to retain Latinos in, on campuses today. So the idea that systemic and institutional racism, at least in the academy, is a problem is a bunch of malarkey, right? So I know that in institutions in America, they're bending over backwards in the name of diversity, which is the buzzword today, to try to diversify campuses. In, instead, of, instead of allowing people and sh making people challenge them to be, to be the greatest version of themselves, they're accepting the mediocre version and just reinforcing that mediocrity. mediocrity. Yeah. And, and that's the way I, I perceive it. Uh, so um, to me, it, it's kind of really against what education was supposed to be. It was a challenge to people. You said something somewhere that education should be a challenge. It should make you uncomfortable because they're challenging you, what you know and what you've learned. Yeah, education by definition is offensive because it challenges received wisdom, right? So it challenges... Say that again, because I think it's important for people to understand that. No, yeah, we live in a, we live in a cult in, a, in an era of, 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 of victimization and, and, and where everyone feels offense, offended because his feelings are hurt or her feelings are hurt and I feel wounded by what you say. But uh, education, by definition, should and ought to be offensive because it, it challenges the orthodoxy of received wisdom. So when you go into a classroom and you, have, you think you have the coercive monopoly on truth, the purpose of a professor is to, is to bring rejoinders, is to bring competing knowledge claims or truth claims to challenge the received wisdom. That, by definition, is disorienting to your sensibilities. That, by definition, challenges received wisdom, and it is offensive, and it should be offensive. You should feel startled when you leave the classroom. You should feel shook to the foundation of your core and think, my God, I just now have to question everything that I was taught. That is what it means to be an enlightened, educated person. Yeah. Then never take anything. Look it out. Look uh, look it up for yourself. But but here's one thing that that uh, uh, to chat, which is being missed today, is that I'm sure in your classroom you have some great discussions, and and you're not afraid to have your students challenge you. I'm no, sure. I love when they challenge. Me. And you lo love when they challenge you because you don't want them. I don't want disciples. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Did you want to say something, Matt? No, I, I agree with what he said. Today, they don't give them the opportunity to be challenged enough. They, they, there is an indoctrination. Yes, that's not right. Not challenges. That's right. Indoctrine. And uh, you, have, you either agree or you have no place in college to, in that particular it, it, campus. Is it true that if a student, uh, and, and I've heard this, that uh, a more, not to put a label on it, but let's you know, a conservative student may challenge a professor in, in a conservative way and really challenge, and that professor will, will give him a bad grade or something like that? I don't think that's hyperbole. I think that's true. You think that's true? I think the professor is filled with so much hatred of America. I say this in We Have Overcome, my book. I say that I cannot emphasize how much professors hate capitalism, hate Western civilization, hate America, uh, and uh, hate but these are people that have grown up here. But well, yeah, go ahead. They also, but those professors are benefiting from the capitalism. They are highly paid, yet none of them have really been out there in the real world creating things. They are living off what's created 
and of their paycheck, mm -hmm. of their tenureship, etc. The, the parasitic welfare scholars. Parasitic welfare scars, yeah. I love. That's right. You know, there's a scene in Ghostbusters 1, which always left an impression on me, uh, and that was when the Ghostbusters got kicked out of, out of the college. They had a room, and they were doing all this para uh, research stuff, and the, the finally the dean kicks them out of school, and they're sitting on the step figuring out what they were going to do, and one of the guys says, uh, uh, you know, we, let's start our own company. And one of the other ones says, wait a minute, we can't do that. They, they expect results out there. They expect us to accomplish something. And, and so, it, to me, that's kind of the mindset of a lot of professors. I mean, they couldn't exist outside the realm of this, this educational uh, welfare state that they live in, right. basically. I'm not sure what year that book was written. It's not a, a new published book. Uh, um, David Orwitz from the Heritage Foundation wrote a book years ago. I have it in my library, though. It's called The Professor, so, double F. They are yes. professing, and there is about 101 professors. This is probably over a decade old, I've read the it, book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he's talking about each professor and their uh, profession. Yeah. Professing. Well, they retreat from a technological civilization that doesn't really care much about the fact that they are largely socially irrelevant <laughs> because they retreat into a bubble where they speak academic jargon and they pursue scholarship and work that has very little to do with the American people and their interests. And the American people are a can-do people. They're a practical people. They are uh, uh, not that they're emotionless, but they, they, they are problem-solving people. They're not a very speculative people. When they speculate, they speculate to solve problems. Academics by orientation are endless theorizers who like to sit and pontificate and think indefinitely. Most Americans are problem solvers. And so most academics, I think, hate Americans for a number of reasons. One, they hate the fact that ca capitalism uh, has outdistanced them, and that capitalism um, is a, f a phenomenon that um, is good, and they hate the good for being the good, as the philosopher Ayn Rand said. But more importantly, it, uh, it makes them socially relevant because all their theories, which purport to predict the failure of capitalism, has not come true. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, global warming, and not to, I could want to get too far into the weeds here, but it's kind of like global warming. You know, the world's going to end 10 years, 11 years. When I was growing up, the ice age was coming by the year the, 2000. Yeah, the, the year 2000. <laughs> but what that does is, in the, at least in the last two, three decades, those professors have indoctrinated what we have today in Washington, who lives in his own bubble. Yes. And they have this shield around them where they are not in touch with, uh, with America, with yeah. the people here. The, people. In the same way in the colleges you see it in our, you know, in our uh, government. You, you, you know, it's interesting to sit here and listen to both of you immigrants to this country who came here, in, in your case, with $100 in your pocket, obviously in um, your situation, a, a few no, more dollars no, than no, that, no. but not we much. No, 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 we worked our own way. We did not use our parents or anything. So, we worked, I so worked you, throughout college, so did my so, husband. So you, you came my here basically with, you, you, and you, nothing was really anything. given to you when you came here, but you took, the, you took advantage of it, uh, of, of, what was, of what was here. Um, and uh, I think uh, Winston Churchill uh, said it the best. He said, well, it's true capitalism distributes wealth unequally. Uh, socialism mm. will distribute miserably equally. And there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, uh, and who was, there was something else that was, I was listening recently, uh, and uh, it talked about how uh, a, uh, a person got away from Cuba with Castro back in the, in the 60s and 70s, and he came here, and uh, the person said, you know, uh, you, you know uh, you know, I'm very lucky to be here. He says, yeah, you're really lucky to be here, but you're, no, you're not lucky because if it changes here, you've got nowhere to escape to. He was able to escape to here to get away from there, but if something happens to America, yeah. there's no other place to escape to because uh, I know of no other country, and I've been around, and I know you've been all over the place, and I know you've been all over the place. There's nothing like this place. No, there isn't. And this is why, without bringing other subjects, that's why there are two 
most, the two most hated countries in the world, which are very much alike, is the, uh, what they call the small Satan and the big Satan, Israel and the U.S. That's true. Israel is a miniature. Uh, everything about Israel or the way it was founded. I mean, my parents, while they, my family, while building their own livelihood, everybody was a new immigrant in Israel, whether you came in the early 1900s or after the Holocaust. Or, uh, some people, nobody even talks about all the Arab countries who expelled the Jewish people. There were over a million peop Jews throughout the Arab world. They took their wealth put them in jail, killed many of them, who came to Israel later on, as, as, as late as the 60s, uh, after uh, Gamal uh, Abdul Nasser. There is so much So that we, 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 you've had a fight through it. Well, the show's just about over, and I want to close. Again, uh, I want you to, this is uh, Dr. Bill's, uh, Dr. Hill's latest book. Uh, doctor, uh, you have a website? Yes. Uh, go that's, ahead. That's uh, www dot jason j a s o n damian d a m i a n hill dot com you can and, find and it. that'll come up uh, on the bottom of your screen so you can copy it down www.jasondamianhill dot com and uh, they'll can follow you do you have facebook uh, page at all yeah facebook page at uh, dr jason hill uh, thirteen um, dot com uh, yeah do uh, you have any uh, website or anything you want to I don't to have any website. Uh, just uh, you. My just name you. at Gmail. And, uh, uh, I tell you, it's a great show. I hope people uh, can appreciate the discussion here. It is a discussion. We as Americans need to have more discussions without acrimony and everything else because that's the only way better ideas come up. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, I'm going to leave you with a Hank Sisko uh, saying, uh, there's two things bad for your heart, running upstairs and running down people. And uh, I think there are good, good reasons to live by that uh, strategy. So thank you very much for joining us. This is Dan Kasasha signing off for The Hank Sisko Show. Mm -hmm.